everyone. Good evening and welcome to my IVF Answers and welcome to our IVF webinar. It's great to see you here um, again, of course. I do hope you had a good evening and are ready to learn a bit more, but also hear about some success uh, stories that uh, Dr. Clara Coloma, which you can see uh, right here, has prepared for all of us. Um, hello, Dr. Clara, welcome back. It's uh, great to have you uh, as our presenter once again. You've been with us before uh, and we are always happy to have you and hear um, about your experience, of course, and today we will talk about advanced maternal age, which always brings lots and lots of questions. So um, thank you for uh, agreeing to join us and hope you are doing fine tonight. You are still at the clinic working, keeping busy, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes, thanks uh, again for the invitation, Caroline. I'm really glad to be able to be back here and hopefully be able to answer some of your questions. I am sure it's going to be an interesting session as well. Remember, uh, we are here to support you, to give you some advice, and of course, um, to provide you with some successful stories. Uh, we will start with the presentation. So afterwards, as always, if you have any questions, detailed ones or less detailed ones, go ahead, type those in. Dr. Coloma, I'm sure, will be happy to help you out. And let me just add that Dr. Clara Coloma, she is the medical deputy, uh, deputy director at uh, Eugene International. So um, she definitely has lots and lots of experience. And there are four cases that she will bring. Uh, she will talk about uh, today, of course. So uh, I guess that's it. We can start with uh, the presentation. And as I mentioned, if you have questions, you can type those in right now or later on, and Dr. Coloma will definitely help you out with those, okay? Don't, don't forget, it's all anonymous, so uh, feel free to ask anything that's on your mind, anything you would like to know, of course, and get some advice, okay? Let's go ahead with our presentation tonight, okay? Okay, so thanks, Caroline, for the introduction, and hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Clara Colomé here at the Eugene Clinic in Barcelona and as again Caroline already said today we'll discuss success stories in patients with advanced maternal age which is uh, we consider is 38 or older. Uh, first I would like to do a small introduction about the situation. Why are we talking about advanced maternal age at this point? Well, because the mean age of women at birth of the first child is increasing in Europe and all over the world. Here you can see the European map and you can see painted in different shades of blue at the age for the first child in different countries. So the darker blue means uh, we have our first child older. So in Ireland, Spain, Italy or Greece, the mean age for the first child is over 30 years old. Clearly, we are the countries with the oldest age for the first child. Here in Spain, it's actually 32. We are the second after Italy. But we can see this trend all over Europe and, in fact, all over the world. And that's why today becoming a parent after 40, giving birth after 40, is twice more frequent than 20 years ago. Uh, we can take a look at all different countries, you know, all over the world. We can see the U.S., uh, in the 80s, chances of delivering after at 40 it was around 5%, and now it's almost 15%. In Spain, well, we clearly establish we are the older, uh, the, the ones who decide older. Uh, but also in Sweden, Russia, well, all over the world, we have seen this trend where we have our first child older and older, and this is due to social changes because the fact of that women, we want to have a career, we want to have, uh, we have what well, we started, uh, you know, working more regularly than 50 years ago. And we want established personal and professional life before deciding to have a child. And that would be okay if it wasn't for nature, <laughs> because nature hasn't prepared us for that. In fact, um, women, we have a determined number of eggs of oocytes in our birth. We do not produce more oocytes in life. We have what we have when we are born and we use them until they're over. And the ovarian reserve usually starts decreasing faster after 35 years old. And this is related to the chances of natural conception. So you can see here, this is the chances of naturally conceiving 
uh, depending on the patient's age. So at 20, chances of having a child eventually are very high, over 80%. But then we reach 40 years old and you can see clearly it declines here. It gets more and more difficult to conceive naturally. And the problem also is that in top of that, the risk of miscarriage increases with age. So it gets more difficult to, to get pregnant. And once we are pregnant, unfortunately, the risk of miscarriage is very high. So it's more and more difficult to eventually finish but with a healthy boy or girl at home. And why is it that? Why do you have a high risk of miscarriage with age? Well, this is linked to all site quality and an euploidy, which means chromosomal abnormalities. So as I told you, we have a determined number of eggs since our birth. It's different in men because they continue to produce new spermatozoa every three months, more or less, until they die. But we have what we have. And the older we get, the fewer oocytes we have. And also, those that remain in the ovaries have accumulated alterations because they've been there for over 40 years. And that means that the chances of having chromosomal abnormalities when the embryo starts multiplying increase. So here you have to graph that show more or less the same information, which means that when we analyze the um, miscarriage material in abortuses following an IVF or an ICSI procedure, we see that the chances of the cause being an aneuploidy, the cause being an chromosomal abnormality of the embryo increases especially after 40 years old. We see that here, one in 25. And we see here, the chances of aneuploidies of chromosomal abnormality increases with age. And this is something that we have to face more and more every day. And we have to find solutions for these kind of problems. Well, because currently almost half of our patients are already 40 years old and old. So you can see here, our statistics at the clinic, where 47% of our patients currently are 40 years old and older, usually between 40 and 44, 45 max. So we have to find solutions for these kind of patients. But as a doctor, as a gynecologist, I think we also have to try to prevent these situations, to be informed, to be prepared for what we're going to find. Because in fact, what we've seen, there have been different population studies about the awareness about fertility and age. And all these studies that analyze the perception of patients, of women who try to conceive after 40, show that unfortunately there's a lack of knowledge about fertility and age. Even doctors, nurses, or even gynecologists have misperceptions about that because in these studies, what it is shown is that while many patients are aware of the fact that when they reach 40 years old, it might be more difficult for them to conceive. This is something that has already been established in society. However, most people perceive or think that it's okay. I won't be able maybe to conceive naturally because I'm 40 years old, I'm 41, I'm 39 but I will go to a fertility center and they will have me conceive and I will have a baby. There's an excess of confidence in ART, in assisted reproductive treatment, because in fact, what the European Fertility Society shows us, tells us, is that the technological advances in ART that have happened in the last 20 years have had little impact in the prognosis of patients 40 years old and older. And unfortunately, we still find ourselves in a situation where pregnancy rates are not very high in this range of age, and there's a high risk of pregnancy lost. The, first a, the, the mean age for the first IBF, for example, here in Spain is already 38 years old. So we are already at advanced maternal age when we go to the clinical uh, facility. And 20% of the treatments in Europe are performed in women who are over 40. This might have some social advantages. There are some advantages of conceiving late in life. Again, more professional stability, economic stability, even personal stability. We have been waiting for you know, uh, our prince uh, to arrive. But then we start the procedure. We start playing this game of IBF already 
in a not very good situation when we are already 38 years old and older. So this is something that we all have to be aware of. However, um, my goal today was clearly to inform you about the situation that we are facing, but also to try to give you real stories about real cases that have happened in our facility that happen here every day that allow women who are 30 year old, 38 year olds or older to have a child, which is eventually our goal. So I'll start with the cases. Um, we have this first case. She was a 42 year old woman. Well, in fact, it was a homosexual couple. One who was 42, the other one was 47. So we didn't have us. And the one who wanted to conceive was 42 years old. Here in Spain, IBF treatments are legal for homosexual couples with donor sperm, for your information. So this patient has a clinical history. She had thyroid, slightly thyroid problem, but was correctly treated and stable. She had removed a polyp through hysteroscopy, nothing else in particular. No previous pregnancies, regular cycles, and she had never tried to conceive. Her BMR was 29, so she was slightly overweight. And her baseline hormonal test that we usually perform around day two to five of uh, the menstrual cycle showed an elevated FSH, which is usually linked to a low ovarian reserve. And this was also confirmed with a uh, vaginal ultrasound where the antral follicle count was around five. She also had performed a hysterosalpingography to certify if, their if her tubes were okay, and it was the case, they were permeable. So she was a 42-year-old woman with a low ovarian reserve, as we would expect at her age, not worse. Again, we discussed with these patients the situation, and since they had never tried to conceive, well, they decided to go for an IBF with their own eggs and donor sperm in order to maximize pregnancy rates compared to an artificial insemination. So we went for a stimulation protocol with high dosage of hormones and in an antagonist protocol, which is what we usually use. And we actually obtained four oocytes. The four of them fertilized after ICSI with donor sperm. And we managed to obtain two embryos that were transferred on day three of embryo development. And unfortunately, the result was negative. Again, since this couple had never tried before, we said, OK, let's try again. We went for a second round of IVF. We slightly changed the protocol. And we found during the second checkup that there was only one follicle developing this time. So we had a discussion with the patients and decided balancing the risk and the benefits, they decided that they wanted to maybe try an artificial insemination donor sperm since there was only one follicle uh, developing. They wanted to avoid the anesthesia and the pickup procedure. And that's what we did. We triggered the ovulation and then we injected sperm from a donor since her tubes were okay. And luckily for them, we achieved a pregnancy and they had a healthy baby boy nine months later. So when we stimulate patients who are over 38, who are over 40, there's a chance of a low response to an IVF stimulation. And in this case, here we try to always discuss with the patient. We do not have one road that we have to follow. There are always different options. And we like to discuss the pros and the cons with each patient and with each couple. So what we usually discussed with the patients this time was we could proceed with the oocyte pickup as planned, assuming that with one or two follicles, there's a risk of not having any embryo to transfer. We could transform the cycle to an artificial insemination, which is what we did in this case. Of course, the tubes have to be okay and we need normal sperm to do that. So if the partner has low quality sperm, this wouldn't be an option. Or we can cancel the cycle and discuss the options there, which would be try to start again, or maybe assume that the ovarian reserve won't give us much more options than those, and then go for an oocyte donation. Here we have this case where we have heterosexual couple. The woman had 43 year old, and they had four year history of infertility. Uh, she had removed a fibroid, few years back, no previous pregnancy, long cycles. 
and the partner didn't have any particular history. They hadn't done any treatment. They had been trying to conceive naturally for four years and it hadn't worked. So we did some workout tests. We always do hormonal tests. Uh, we always do vaginal ultrasound and we always check the sperm. These are the three main tests that gives us an idea, that give us an idea of the situation regarding the options that we have. And we found out that the AMH or anti-mullerian hormone, which gives us an idea of the ovarian reserve, was very low, 0 0.1. And the antrophollicle count was, according to that result, was two follicles, which is very low. On the male side, the sperm was normal. So we discussed the options with the patients. Usually after 43 years old, when we find a low ovarian reserve, we have a tendency of at least offering the possibility of changing the female gamete and go for an outside donation. But this couple, they had never tried before, so they wanted to try with their own eggs and of course their own sperm. So that's what we did. Since we didn't expect a very high response, we tried a modified natural cycle, which is a very mild stimulation protocol, and we obtained one oocyte that was mature, but unfortunately there was a fertilization failure. This happens when we only have one, you know, it's just 50-50. At that point, the couple decided that, okay, they had tried. This happens quite often in, our, in my consultation where we, couples need to try. And we try because we think it might work, but we need to be aware of the limitation. But once they've tried psychologically, they can also, you know, decide that, okay, we've tried, we've done our best. Unfortunately, it's not working. So let's change to something that will give us better options. So they decided to go for an IVF with donor oocytes. Here in Spain, all donors are less than 35 years old. So they have good quality and quantity of ovarian reserve. So we obtained six embryos. And we only transfer one, of course, on day five, we transfer a very good, good blastocyst and she's currently pregnant. So it worked. Then we have this other case. Here's again a heterosexual couple, 41 year old woman. This couple did what they had to do, in fact. What we usually advise, what the World Health Organization advises is that when you're 38 years old and older, you should try to conceive naturally for six months, but then if it doesn't work, don't wait any longer. Go to your gynecologist, go to a fertility center to do a baseline study to see if there's something else wrong besides your age. This patient had endometriosis, mild endometriosis, but still they had removed a cyst a few years back and had removed a fiber from her uterus. No, pre no previous pregnancies, regular cycles normal BMI, a low ovarian reserve. She had an image that was low 0 0.7. Vaginal ultrasound showed correct number of follicles considering. And regarding the male partner, there was no relevant medical history, no previous children and a normal sperm count. So we discussed again the situation with this couple. And of course they wanted to try with their own eggs. So we did one IBF cycle with a higher dosage stimulation on an antagonist protocol. We obtained two oocytes, but both fertilized and they managed to evolve up until day three. So we transferred two day three embryos, but unfortunately it didn't work. Since we had managed to get to the end of the procedure, they wanted to try again. We tried again, but unfortunately there was one of only one follicle developing. And again, we had the same discussion with these couples and with the first couple, but in this case, they decided to cancel the cycle. They said, okay, we don't want to take any risks. We'll stop here and we'll start again. And that's what we did. We slightly changed the protocol again. And this time we obtained actually five oocytes, five mature oocytes, four fertilized with the partner sperm through ICSI. And we transferred two to the embryos on day three. And she actually has a baby girl now uh, who was born. She's, she's almost one year old now. And they still have one frozen embryo from the same cycle. So we usually recommend to do a maximum of three or four IBF cycles, because after that, we see that pregnancy rates will never increase. Well, they, it can work, but cumulative pregnancy rates start to decrease. Up until three, it could eventually be feasible uh, in some particular cases, such as this one. And this is the um, last case I'll show you before starting to answer some of the questions that are already appearing. 
again, a heterosexual couple. This one is older, 44 year old woman. It's kind of a limit for us. Again, as I told you, usually after 43, we in general, regardless of the ovarian reserve, start advising to do uh, an oocyte donation cycle as a first option, first line treatment. In this case, this couple already had children together. They had two previous children that were aged seven and five. Uh, after two IVFs that had been performed at 37, 38 years old. So they had a history of IVF that had worked a few years back, but she was already 37, 38. She had regular cycles, partner had no relevant medical history. And for this third child, in fact, they had performed already an IVF cycle in another center with a negative result after transferring to day three embryos. So they came to the clinic. And we did some baseline tests. We did a hormonal test that showed normal FSH and an AMH that was quite good considering the age. 1.7 is low, but it's very good considering the age at 44 is very good result. And she had some follicles on her ovaries and the sperm was normal. In this situation, again, due to age and due to the previous IVF fail cycle, we advised them maybe to change the female gamete, but they were not ready for that. They had already had children with, uh, through IVF, so they wanted to try again. And since the hormonal levels were correct, we didn't see any medical contraindication for that. So we went for an IVF with a higher dosage stimulation protocol. Uh, we used some estrogen on the previous cycle to try to synchronize better the procedure. We obtained five oocytes, four were fertilized, which is very good result. And we transferred two embryos on day three and they implanted. There was, um, um, there was a positive pregnancy test. There was a first ultrasound with a positive heartbeat, but unfortunately it was a miscarriage at eight weeks of pregnancy. At this point, we didn't have any left embryos. So the patients at this point accepted that even though she managed to get pregnant with her own ex, there was also this risk of miscarriage and chromosomal abnormality, especially that they didn't want to, you know, to have as high as they were having. It was quite traumatic for this patient. So they decided to accept at this point donor oocyte. We inseminated the oocyte from the donor with V partners frozen sperm through ICSI and we obtained seven mm -hmm. embryos. We took them to day five to blastocyst stage. We transferred one bl lovely blastocyst and unfortunately it was negative. And then we had six frozen blastocysts. So we decided to do a natural preparation cycle for the endometrium where we basically monitor the natural ovulation cycle and we transfer another lovely blastocyst that was thought on the same day to this patient's uterus and she's currently pregnant uh, with another baby girl. In fact, it will be her third baby girl. We cannot choose the sex here in Spain, uh, but they're very happy. So this is a success story case, but when we discuss, when I discuss with my patients who are 34, 38 and older, we always have to inform the patient of the risk associated to pregnancies over 40 years old mostly miscarriage and aneuploidies of chromosomal abnormalities, and also obstetrical pathologies such as diabetes, preeclampsia, or preterm labor. Some of the risks, basically the ones linked to the quality of the oocyte, miscarriage, aneuploidies, are minimized with the use of donor oocytes, such as in this cycle. However, other risks such as diabetes or preeclampsia, which is high blood pressure during pregnancy, these are linked to the age and especially to the health status of the patient. And that's why we also uh, monitor the weight. Uh, we advise our patients to quit smoking. Is that the case? We control the thyroid function. We want to make sure before conceiving that the other risk factors are as minimal as possible to achieve again a healthy child, which is our goal. So those are the real and success stories that I had for you today. I hope they were interesting and maybe now we can we can try to answer some of the um, questions uh, that are already here. 
if that's okay. Definitely okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Colomé. That was definitely interesting. And it, I think it's always inspiring to hear uh, different cases, different, of course, different age, different stories. Uh, but it's always great to see that there are ways to, to, um, to and you are able still to, to help those patients. And of course, yeah. thank you so much for bringing those. Um, I always love to hear those, that's for sure. Uh, I, you can never get tired to hear such stories, that's for sure. So thanks indeed. And you are right. There are some questions. Uh, so now your favorite part. I know it's always your favorite part. So let's go ahead with the questions. Of course, remember, it's all anonymous. You can go ahead, type those in, get some advice. Um, and Dr. Clara will definitely help you out. Okay. Um, okay, so I will go to the question that we've got from Nuria, because it's in regards to the last case you have talked about. Mm -hmm. So why don't do a biopsy to see chromosomal abnormalities when it comes to the last case? This is a very, very interesting and good question, Nuria. Thank you. And in fact, it's something that we ask ourselves every day. I know that there are also, there are different schools on PGT, which is the genetic testing of the embryos. And in fact, well, I could do another whole topic about that. In fact, there are a few, there have been a few. One of my colleagues, Dr. Abraham, already did one on that. I know for sure, because it's a discussion topic with gynecologists and fertility experts everywhere in the world. Um, we try to individualize each case. So I know there are centers that when you reach 40 years old, they always go for an IVF with a PGT. Randomized studies have shown us that PGT, which is analyzing the embryo, helps us in certain cases reduce basically the time to obtain a pregnancy um, and might reduce slightly the risk of miscarriage during the first trimester. But unfortunately, and I wish it was different and hopefully it will be in a few years when technology changes. But at this point, PGT doesn't allow us to say that you will have more chances of having a healthy child in the end, considering the cumulative cycle. So what we usually do, we usually discuss PGT in patients over 38 year olds in our facility. There's always an option who is, that's there, but we try to individualize. So if we have a good number, the um, Azure Society, the European Society, and the most recent the STAR study, the, rest, and the most recent studies on, on studies on PGT tell us that if you're over 38 years old and you have a good ovarian reserve, that is the case where you will most likely benefit from a PGT. In other cases, it depends. What we usually do is we analyze the number of oocytes that we obtain. We analyze the fertilization rates. And then we analyze the evolution of, we put the, embry the embryos in our time life incubators that allow us to control much better the development of those embryos. And then on day three, we see how many embryos there we have and their characteristics. And depending on that, we advise the patients to go for a day three transfer, for example, or leave them in culture up until day five, because you know there will be a loss from day three to day five. We've had for many years, many pregnancies transferring day three embryos. Day five, we know, allows us to select better the best embryo. So we try to go there. That's what we do automatically, for example, with donor eggs. But there's also a risk. So if we only have one embryo, or two embryos, what are the advantages of waiting longer? Well, we have a huge risk of losing everything. So when we have at least two blastocysts and you're over 38, I will recommend you to do a PGT, assuming the risk and limitations. In this last case, this patient was 44. We had two embryos on day three. We had beforehand discussed this, discussed this possibility with the patients. And I told them that if we had a good result, then maybe it will help us. Uh, but if they assumed that we might not have any embryos to transfer, we decided to transfer on day three because there were only two embryos. Thank you indeed for that question. And thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kolome, for this uh, advice. And you are right. We did have a webinar, actually, success stories about uh, genetics, PGTA. And of course, Dr. Abraham, also from Eugene, was here with us. So of course, I can only encourage you to have a look at the previous webinar to see some cases where actually PGTA has been used. Maybe it might be um, useful for you as well. But thanks so much. Definitely interesting question. 
Um, there are different cases and there are different uh, questions here as well. So let me go to this question, okay? So how many M2 or sites are needed for 40 year old to obtain a blastocyst? I'm 40, no previous attempts, one child conceived naturally, very low AMH, not ready for egg donation. Any advice? So thank you, Kate, for this question, uh, which is, mm, well, there are quite a few, two questions actually at the same time. But um, unfortunately, your case is um, relatively and more and more common, again, as we've seen. Um, I'll go with first part. How many M2O sites are needed for 40 years old to obtain a blastocyst? It's very difficult to say, in fact. Um, the blastulation uh, process, which is the process that takes the embryo from day three to a blastocyst stage, is around 60%. So in good conditions, 60% of the embryos reach blastocyst stage. If you're 40, probably this percentage is slightly lower. And this is the percentage that we obtain using, of course, the time lapse incubators, for example, the Amberscope, that's the one that we use here, but there are different uh, brands. But mm, this is in an environment where we control all the rest of the elements of the equation. I know there's kind of a trend now to think that the best thing is to transfer an euploid blastocyst. And this, this is true, but in, in a theoretical world, when we do an stimulation for your ovaries it is you know there are different it's like a hurdle race for the ovaries so we have to go through different steps and we don't like to i don't like to give you a general road that you have to follow all my patients 40 years old have to do this and this and this no each case is different the patient is different we have to see the results as they come so uh i don't i mean usually in order to reach um for example, when we go for a PGT, eh, we like to have 10, 15 metaphase to all sites beforehand that will most likely allow us to have at least two, three blastocysts. So, um, in fact, we just need one to reach blastocyst stage. We usually um, go for a blastocyst culture when we have at least three good quality embryos on day three. And in order to have that, we would need to have probably five or six uh, mature all sites. But again, this is something that we see one step at a time. And reaching blastocyst stage alone allows us to select easier the best embryo, and it allows us to minimize the risk of a multiple pregnancy. But if one embryo will implant, it will implant regardless if we transfer them on day three or day five. Regarding advice for a solution, of course, I understand that it's not easy to accept changing your genetics. So uh, I would encourage you to maybe try one attempt at 40 uh, with already a child. Of course, clearly you will have a low AMH. I'm guessing you've already talked to a gynecologist or fertility specialist. That's the first thing I would, I would advise you to do. And well, without the details, it's very difficult to say, but I would recommend you, of course, clearly, if you're smoking, quit smoking. If you're slightly overweight, lose weight and have a healthy um, a healthy lifestyle before starting. And then listen, we have to try, otherwise we won't know. So good luck, Kate. And be, you know, we have to be aware of the limitation, but also be positive once you start the procedure. Thank you so much indeed for your advice. And of course, Kate, for sharing. And of course, fingers crossed. And if there's anything else you would like to add, go ahead. Um, doctors always need more details. Uh, so, of course, I just want to mention to everyone that remember, uh, you can always get in touch with Dr. Colomay and anyone at Eugene Clinic, and I'm sure they will be happy to help you out. They just need more details to give you proper advice. As always, it's it's always the case, right? So, uh, so thanks so much indeed. Um, let's have a look, okay? More questions are coming up, and let's have a look at this one. Age 42, how do you make endometrial lining smooth? My doc said it was wavy. Anything you can add? Well, I would say endometrium, uh, endometrium is a complicated um, element. Um, it's, you, you, the most important element for the success of an IBF is clearly the oocyte and its quality. I mean, sperm is important. 
the uterus is important, but the most important thing is the oocyte. But then we do not have to forget about the endometrium, of course. Uh, regarding the lining of the endometrium, um, first of all, when we are not sure of, if there's something happening there, uh, we always do a hysteroscopy and an endometrial biopsy to rule out infection, to make sure there's not a, you know, a polyp or whatever, and to see the cavity by itself. And then sometimes when we have endometriums that do not thicken correctly or that do not have a good pattern for the transfer, when we've done an IBF, for example, we decide maybe to freeze the embryo and try another protocol to prepare the endometrium. Again, I'm just, you know, assuming and talking a bit general because I don't really know the details of your case, Sima, but, but probably that's what we would do in this case. So thank you for the question. Hope it helped you. Thank you indeed. And of course, uh, if you have anything else, go ahead, type this in, of course. Um, okay, uh, let me have a look. Kate has another question. Is it possible to predict chances of a, for a successful treatment, both for IUI and IVF based on the AMA, AMH value? What would the value be? Thanks for this question, Kate. Um, in fact, AMH is an element that we use a lot, but AMH levels, AMH is a hormone that's produced in the ovary, in fact, in the, in the follicle, and it gives us an idea of the, the amount of um, ovarian reserve that it is left. Unfortunately, it knows it's not a direct predictor of success of IBF. It gives us especially an idea of the quantity uh, that we will have. It gives me an idea of whether this patient will respond correctly to the stimulation and she will be a low responder or a high responder. And it allows me to adjust the dosage of medication, especially, especially when we talk about IBF treatments. There is slight correlation with, between uh, AMH levels and mm, pregnancy rates, but it's not direct. So, I mean, again, I might have a 39 year old patient with a very good AMH. Uh, we consider it normal AMH when each two nanograms per milliliter or more in general. And I might have a 39 year old patient with, I don't know, an AMH of four. And she might respond very well to the simulation. I might have many embryos, but her chances of conceiving will still be lower than that of a 29 year old with an AMH of 2.0. Because the age of the oversight is the most important factor when we discuss um, success rates for both treatments. So again, what we consider a normal AMH would be two nanograms per milliliter, per milliliter or more, because there are different units to measure the AMH. Uh, but it doesn't unfortunately allows us to correlate these results with your pregnancy rates. Basically, it allows us to correlate it with the chances of you responding to the treatment and how to adjust the protocol uh, to that. So thanks. I hope it helped you, Kate. Thanks indeed, of course. And uh, for the clarification to this as well. Um, okay, next uh, question, next case, right? Some more details here. So I'm 38, almost 39 with PCOS, AMH of 2.88. I am lowering my BMI, BMI to below 30. Otherwise healthy, I have never tried to conceive what factors can I look at to decide whether to go for IUI versus IVF? Well, uh, first of all, thank you for your question and all the details, Arianna. Um, it is a, an extremely good thing that you're trying to lower your BMI to below 30. This is one of the most important things you can do to help yourself. Uh, there are other things. Well, uh, polycystic ovary syndrome has to be taken into account. The AMH, I don't know the unit, probably it's nanograms per milliliter to the value. Um, well, if you have never tried to conceive, of course, we would also have to uh, analyze the presence or absence of a partner. But usually at 38, almost 39, if your ovarian reserve is acceptable, probably I would recommend you, and of course, again, this I lack information, I will need an ultrasound uh, and other factors, but I would have a tendency to go for an IBF to maximize pregnancy rates because chances are still quite 
reasonable. So I think I would try to go for an IVF to maximize your chances. Um, IUI is usually for patients who have, for example, never tried to conceive naturally and who have, I don't know, never had a male partner who wants to minimize the intake of hormones or, you know, who have financial difficulties. Uh, IUI is a more economic treatment. But then I would recommend you not to wait. In any case, I would recommend you not to wait. You have to go for it. You're still at a point where your chances are reasonably good. So I would probably decide for an IBF in order to, again, shorten the time to pregnancy and maximize your chances and also have more information. So thanks, Arianna. Thanks again, of course, for your question, for your advice, Dr. Kalame. And uh, let's have a look. More questions are coming up. Uh, also, Naria has added lovely, wonderful presentation. Thank you, of course, for your answer as well. Um, there are like you, two questions uh, as of now. So remember that if you have more, go ahead, type those in. And let's have a look. Olga has another question. In case of natural cycle, where selected one or oh, sorry one egg is selected we recommend i guess embryo you recommend to transfer day three or five again we try to individualize decisions with our patients i give them a recommendation but this is something that we here uh, in our center or myself we i always try to um you know um, take the decision, of course, giving the best advice that can, but with the patient, not for the patients, discussing the pros and the cons, because unfortunately, fertility is not an exact science. <laughs> uh, it's not mathematics. But uh, usually in case of a natural cycle where we only, uh, when we do a natural cycle or a mild stimulation cycle, the goal of the treatment is to try to obtain one or good, one or two good quality oocytes, not more. So we usually recommend to transfer on day three. I mean, we could eventually wait for day five. But again, what will be the advantage if we only have one embryo to take it to day five? Okay. I mean, there's a school that says, okay, if it doesn't reach day five, it will never work. Yeah, the problem is that we will never know if it would have reached day five inside the uterus. Our incubators right now are extremely good. We have the best technology clearly here at our center, but many centers have the same technology. We are very good with that, but still it's not a real uterus. So if I only have one day three, if you only have one embryo, I always recommend to transfer on day three if the embryo has good characteristics. Of course, if we have doubts of its viability, then I would say, okay, let's wait a bit more to you know see more. But I don't see the advantage of waiting when we only have one because we won't select it any better. So it, if it has to be implanted, it will implant regardless if we transfer it on day three or day five in this case in particular. But of course, again, if one of my patients assumes the risk of having zero embryos to transfer on day five and wants to go for blasters to see how it looks on day five, we could do that eventually. Thanks for your question, Olga. We always have lots of discussions on day three versus day five with our patients. It's Thanks indeed, of course. And again, thank you so much for the clarification to this one. There are like two questions left. We will be slowly finishing. So if you have more, you know what to do. Go ahead and do it now. Um, let's have a look, okay? And Kate has one more question. How does egg retrieval affect thyroid? If there is an ele elevated thyroid after retrieval, will it stay that way forever? Well, actually, the egg retrieval itself doesn't impact on the thyroid. Um, um, hormonal stimulations might have an impact on the thyroid function. In fact, around 20 to 30 percent of women in general will have eventually thyroid pro problems during her life. So it's quite common to have thyroid alterations. Infertility, we're really, really cautious with thyroid function because a study shows us that if TSH, which is the, the hormone that's produced uh, and that makes the thyroid work, if TSH is higher than a certain range, the risk basically of miscarriage during the first trimester increases. So that's why we try to keep it under a regular range. Um, and hormonal treatments might impact on the thyroid function. The fact that after a stimulation and a pickup uh, procedure, your thyroid, your TSH level were high, 
means uh, probably they will go back to normal in a few weeks or a month or two. But that means that you're high risk of developing thyroid pro problems later on life. The important thing about thyroid uh, function, Kate, is to control it regularly. Uh, because if it's not perfect, it's okay. We have ways of controlling it. We have medication that's easy to take that allows us to control it better. So the important thing is to control it. But the impact of hormonal stimulation or hormonal changes on the thyroid function exists. And it usually disappears over time, over a month or two max. Thanks for your question again. Thank you indeed. And I just want to follow up. And can you tell us what is that range that's, that we need to control yeah. it? What is the range? So when we, when we discuss about hypothyroidism, which is the real alteration of the thyroid, and you talk to GPs, general doctors, they say that it should be uh, lower than four or five. But for fertility... Uh, purposes, we like it to be between 0 .0 0 0.5 and 2.5. That's right. our ideal because if it's higher than 2.5, it usually slightly increases the risk of first trimester miscarriage. Thank you so much indeed. Of course, I ask because this is a question that always oh. it's quite common for sure. And mm -hmm. I know that the ranges can sometimes, you know, they provide different ones. So yeah. just wanted to follow up on that but thank you so much Kate this is definitely a thing I think that is um, keep, uh, coming up very very often so thanks a lot for bringing this mm -hmm. all right thanks uh, again and let's have a look that might be our final question so of course if you have more go ahead type the question in and the question is right here so what are, what are the effects of obesity on the quality of foresight and embryos well uh, obesity it clearly has been determined as one uh, risk factor for infertility. Um, it alters the quality of the oocyte, especially. Uh, it doesn't really affect the embryo per se, but it affects the it might affect the quality of the oocyte, and therefore it might be more difficult for this oocyte to be fertilized and to develop into an embryo. And then once we transfer the embryo into the uterus, we've seen that obesity has been linked to implantation problems. It is uh, the vascularization of the uterus might be affected. The hormonal balance in the body might be altered. And therefore it is more, there has to be when we, actually it's fascinating when we transfer one embryo to the, to the uterus, there has to be kind of a biochemical dialogue between them. They actually have to do like a mating ritual, the endometrium and the, and the embryo, they have to get to know each other and decide if they like each other or not. It's, it's, it's like that actually. So, if there's an obesity, the ambience of this endometrium even immunologically might be altered and therefore it's more difficult for the embryo to attach. And then it has also been directly linked to the risk of first trimester miscarriage. Obesity increases the risk of first trimester miscarriage and increases even the risk of some genetic abnormalities. So losing weight, I know it's not always easy, but it's something that you can change. Unfortunately, we cannot yet change the egg, the age of the oocytes, but maybe we will eventually, but we cannot now. But acting on your weight has a direct impact on your own health, of course, and definitely in your chances of having a child. And I can only show you the answer, of course, for that. <laughs> Thank you so much for right. from the patient for right here. You can see it. Um, thanks so much indeed for your advice. Okay, might be our final question. Okay, for Fabiana, would you recommend duo steam cycles for women over 40? Well, duo steam cycles, for those of you who don't know already, I'm sure most of you do because you are quite experts, but uh, means that we do an ovarian stimulation, we do a pickup, and then a few days later, two to five days later, usually, we start stimulating again to basically accumulate uh, oocytes or embryos. This is something that has been done specially for PGT purposes in order to accumulate embryos to do a genetic biopsy. We do not do it very often because, well, usually it's advised for financial reasons because if you have more embryos, it is, you know, cheaper to do the biopsy and analysis. It's not the case here at the clinic. So we do not usually do that because, um, for example, if we have if we have at least two good quality blastocysts, 
I and you want to do a PGT, I would go for a PGT. Because if the good embryo is there, What's the point of repeating and repeating simulations and accumulate embryos? And maybe the good one was the first one, you know? But I've had patients, for example, who tell me, I'm 39, I'm 40, and I would like to try to have, I don't know, at least two children. But for whatever reason, I cannot do the transfer now, or I don't know, I'm moving and now I can do the stimulation and in a couple of months I won't be able to. Then yes, this is a good strategy basically to gain time. Regarding results, it doesn't change much. And for me, it's not the goal of the treatment because the goal of the treatment is to get you pregnant as soon as possible, not to accumulate embryos. But it is a good strategy in some cases in particular, yeah. Again, we have to individualize. It's always kind of the answer, right, <laughs> to this, but it's oh, amazing. Sorry, to... but it's, it's, it's the reality. True. It's true. This is, uh, this is great, of course. This is how it works, right? So um, I think that whenever we are repeating this, this means that, you know, you need to remember this is the most important uh, thing in this whole thing. Um, thank you so much indeed. What can I say? As you can see, another thank you is coming up for you. Thank you for your detailed thank answer. You. Um, and as I've mentioned, that it looks like that was our final question. But of course, you know, uh, someone is typing, I'm not sure. Uh, but of course, remember that if you have more questions, I can only encourage you to go ahead, get in touch with Dr. Colome and anyone at uh, Eugene Clinic. And I'm sure um, they will be happy to help you. If you haven't seen, we had some um, fertility specialists from Eugene already, and they are always eager to answer and help you out. And no doubt, Dr. Kalama will be happy to assist you with some details. As she already said, every case is different. Every case uh, needs to be individualized. So, you know, I'm sure Dr. Kalama will need more details to give you a proper advice, right? <laughs> so, yes. Don't hesitate. And um, thank you so much. We'll be finishing for tonight. But thank you, uh, Dr. Clement. It was, it was great to have you back here once again. Again, very interesting session. Thank you for all your questions. You make it also interesting. You bring different questions. Um, so it's always great to, to see it. And before we finish, anything else you would like to add? I would like to change every, to thank everyone for their attention and their questions because they are always a challenging audience and I always like that and I hope this was useful and again as you said if there's anything else you need to know just you know where to find me and our team thanks again exactly. Caroline for having us thanks so much for joining us and I'm already looking forward to some more events with you and I know it's going to happen soon right <laughs> so sure. so thank you so much indeed and uh, remember it has been recorded so if anyone missed any part of this you will be able to have a look at the webinar tomorrow at myavfenses.com and if you go to my uh, our sorry youtube channel you can go ahead and see it all as well and there are already 401 ivf webinars so plenty of um knowledgeable i guess as well right you can learn a lot from those webinars and dr claire has been with us before so you can have a look at her previous webinars on some other topics and i'm sure it's going to be interesting so thanks a lot everyone and we will be back next week on monday we are back with some more topics more success stories so tune in sign up and ask your questions as always okay thank you so much have a lovely weekend and i'm sorry I can just show you this last question because someone has put this right here. I still think we can answer. So is there a success case that a success cases that over 45? With donor X, plenty. <laughs> okay. <laughs> With your own outside, which is I'm guessing where the question is leading. Uh, there have been a few in the literature. Here in the clinic, we've been working for over 22 years old and 20 yeah 22 years old now and we do thousands of cycles every year and we probably have had a handful of patients at 45 who have conceived and had managed to have a child at the end clearly huh? because this should go a positive pregnancy test yes absolutely um a child at home the oldest we've had is 45 we accept do IVF with uh, your own eggs, which I, I haven't told you before. I can, you know, until you're 46 included in very, very limited and specific and selected cases. But unfortunately, we haven't had any success case at 46. And that's what we stopped there. 
Thank you for the clarification and thank you for that last minute question, but we don't mind at all. Thanks so much indeed. Uh, that will be it for tonight. Uh, so thanks a lot for all of your questions as always. And uh, Dr. Vera, see you very soon. And everyone, as I've mentioned, okay. hopefully you will be able to join us on Monday. There are more cases, more questions I'm sure that you have. So uh, see you all very soon and have a good evening as well. Take care. Bye-bye.